Information Journalism, is a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and he was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2018 Aerospace Media Awards, of which I was honored to be a judge at one point. So <laughs> congratulations on that, and I'll turn it over to you, Graham. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So uh, we are uh, rightly, uh, all of us, um, remembering and uh, appreciating the achievements of Apollo, Apollo 11, but we should also remember that in 1969 there were a couple of other quite interesting events for the aerospace industry that have uh, had uh, long-term implications and were enabled by the air-breathing propulsion industry and by its cooperation in certainly one case with NASA. And that was the first flight of the 747 and the first flight of Concorde. Now the 747 obviously introduced the, the, the high bypass turbofan to commercial aviation. And Concorde, although it was uh, commercially not as successful, was, is acknowledged as being a great technological achievement and an inspiration in the way that Apollo 11 is for people today. And that was one of the most complicated high performance engines to ever fly on a commercial aircraft, had its origins in, in military technology, and, and to this day, that connection between commercial and the military technology is very strong in the air, in the air breathing propulsion industry. So, um, some people say that we're actually uh, either entering or poised on a, an, an, a new era in, uh, in aviation as we look at uh, Aviation being redefined in terms of mobility in many, many different ways, and that goes from, from uh, drone delivery to urban air taxis to hybrid electric regional airliners to ultra-efficient subsonic airliners to even possibly supersonic and some say even possibly hypersonic. So, and all of that is, is fundamentally enabled by propulsion. It, it's, it is the continued development of the turbine engine, the emergence of electric, and uh, developments that we're seeing in, in, in high-speed propulsion that are all going to... Um, ..are all going to contribute to this sort of change. How fast it will, it will happen, we don't know, but it, we are clearly in, in a in a time of great change. So, so our panel here tonight, today, tonight, <laughs> today, are, uh, are, are experts in air breathing propulsion and they will, they will um, begin by making some, some short comments, um, to give us some idea of their views on what, where we stand and what may come next. And also the strong connection to NASA and to NASA Glenn in continuing to advance air breathing propulsion. Now, um, I'm actually going to do it alphabetically by, by company, just to be fair, so it's not the order they're sitting in here. But anyway, so first to speak will be Carl Sheldon in the middle there. He's the general manager for large military engines at General Electric Aviation. And uh, Carl began his career with GE at, Global, at GE's Global Research Center, which is a pretty amazing place. And he, where he worked in turbine machinery design, he then moved to GE to work on the F-110 engine, which is one of the great... Uh, military engines today in the F-16 and things like that. But also on the civil side, he did actually, he was involved in CFM-56, which is another great engine. Uh, so then will be Jeff. Uh, Jeff is Senior Vice President of Engineering at Pratt & Whitney. I was just making sure that P came before R. Um, <laughs> and he leads the global engineering team de developing technologies for the next generation of commercial and military engines. Jeff was previously Vice President Engineering Technology for UTC Aerospace Systems, which we are all having to get used to calling Collins Aerospace these days. Uh, and he began his career in the UK, as, I, as did I, at Rolls-Royce. Uh, and then Mark is uh, Chief Operating Officer of Rolls-Royce North American Technologies, which we all know as Rolls-Royce Liberty Works. Where he leads an agile team developing innovative power and propulsion systems for US defense customers. Mark joined roles in 1982. So we'll begin by Carl. Great. Okay, thank you, Graham. Uh, good morning, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. Would, thought I would start out talking, uh, kind of opening up this panel and, and talking about NASA's collaboration with industry and innovation over the decades with just a little bit of history of where uh, NASA and in, in what I'm going to talk about, GE, started crossing paths back into the 50s 
and pretty quick going to go into what it means to the products that are out there today and the collaboration that we have, and then a quick look into the future. So the first chart is uh, just kind of a look back into some of the innovation and collaboration between NASA and the air breathing propulsion community. Some wonderful references out there and some of the first confluences of NASA and GE that came together go back to the 50s. Of course in the upper center there is Richard Whitcomb who's largely credit credited with the area rule which governs transonic and supersonic flight and his discovery of that uh, manifested itself into the F-104, which was powered by a GE J-79 engine, which in 1956 became the first aircraft to exceed the s twice the speed of sound. And from there, the innovations uh, just started and have kept going through today, not just with GE, but with all my colleagues up here and, and the entire aerospace air breathing business. Uh, countless number of demonstrators, a lot of work in emissions and sound, thank goodness for that. Um, novel architectures, and uh, certainly, last but not least here, safety. A lot of work that NASA's done in collaboration with the industry on safety. And, and so as I was kind of going through some of the history, I wanted to, to connect a lot of this innovation with the products that are out there today that are in our world. And the next slide kind of shows a rather amazing lineage of connection and demonstrator between NASA and GE and how that's, that's made its way into the market today. Back in the 70s, the Quixie engine, which was essentially one of the first uh, geared turbofan engines to be demonstrated. And then probably one of the biggest is the E-cubed program that was in the 80s. Uh, and that led to the compression technology that's in the GE90 today and quite frankly, uh, on up through even some of our current development. The unducted fan, which was in the mid 80s, probably an engine before its time, uh, but even today is starting to raise eyebrows again because of its amazing propulsive efficiency. Uh, and certainly the Tech 56, which has made a lot of those technologies into CFM, both the CFM 56 product line and the Leap engine, which was recently launched. And then a lot of those technologies have also made its way to the, the military side of the market. Uh, in the AATE engine, which is an early manifestation of what is now the ITEP engine, uh, and AATD, which is now uh, under development as the XA100, um, and a version of it at Pratt & Whitney as well. So a lot of technology demonstrations that have been conducted over the years, a lot, and most of that technology has made it into products that we see out there today, and that innovation continues not only in demonstrators, but in, in module and component technologies. And the last slide is just kind of a hint at where we think things are going in the future. That, that innovation and that history will continue. And gas turbines have a lot yet to give, but they will probably take a different form than what we know today. We see a lot of work going on, certainly in the uh, electric hybrid area, uh, additive manufacturing and composites and ceramics, a new modality of materials and manufacturing, uh, and combustions and alternate fuels as well, we think are going to be uh, pretty significant playing into the future. So really look forward to what that future holds and the collaboration between NASA and industry being really the, the glue that ties a lot of that work together. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Jeff? <clears throat> Thanks, Graham. Uh, so I thought I'd, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought I'd start off talking a little bit about United Technologies um, and the role United Technologies has played in collaboration with um, with NASA. As uh, many of you know, Pratt & Whitney is a, uh, is a part of United Technologies. And when you look at our broader portfolio, uh, we have a long and rich history of collaboration. Uh, we developed the spacesuits for the Gemini program and have continued to develop along those lines to the, to the point where we've, uh, we've worked up to about 150 EVAs um, from the International Space Station uh, in recent years. Uh, we provided fuel cells that supported the initial uh, moon landings, uh, life support systems for the International Space System are a big part of the portfolio there. And then when you come down to Pratt & Whitney, we go back to the, uh, the RL-10 engines, uh, you know, the first liquid hydrogen engines uh, were developed um, by
by Pratt & Whitney and we were involved very heavily in the, uh, in the engines for the space shuttle. So in the space world, uh, at a UTC level, very strong, coming into Pratt & Whitney, but as we look at the air breathing world, Pratt & Whitney, uh, similar to, to I think uh, all of the engine manufacturers over the past decades, has, has really enjoyed great, uh, great partnership with NASA in developing the underlying technologies that feed into our, uh, our programs and gas turbine programs in general. Um, some of the key areas that I, that, I, that I point out is, as we look at component rigs, I'm not gonna draw all the way through the chart here, but you get a flavor of how component technology development in areas like fan drive gear systems, uh, combustion systems, variable area nozzles, and, and the like, have been the subject of collaborative um, rig testing. We've worked extensively um, on engine level and even going into airplane level architectural traits that have really informed us of where we need to be pushing our technologies to push into the, uh, the next generation, aimed predominantly at, at a world where fuel burn, emissions, noise, and reliability are pushing to levels that the prior generation uh, would not have been able to achieve. Um, from there, we look up to some of the, the, the demonstrator programs that, uh, that we've worked, full engine demonstrator programs, UET, the Quiet Aircraft uh, Technologies Program, Envert, um, some of these programs have really helped us to push on the evolution of technologies, turbine aerodynamics, compressor stage loading, acoustics, um, prognostics and health management have been an important development in this area. And as you bring all of these technologies together, you can see how they feed in to some of the products that are fielded today. Um, we introduced the gear turbofan about three years ago into, into service. About a thousand engines have now been produced. Um, that engine delivers 16% lower fuel burn, 75% lower noise, 50% lower emissions, and has reliability at this point uh, that that matches engines that have been in service for 30 years in terms of dispatch from the gate. So those are, those are tremendous um, indications of the power of the partnership of uh, these early technologies and how they feed, uh, feed where, we, uh, where we field our products today. Uh, as we look to the future, we have continuing partnership in areas like hybrid electric propulsion boundary layer ingestion, materials, ceramics development and the like are all critical to where we may see the next architectural steps um, in industry. And I'd, and I'd close this just as a comment and our view of uh, NASA. Um, as a national asset, you know, the people and the capability uh, of the organization really provide a great uh, benefit to the nation as a whole, the way industry can develop uh, products, the way we can move forward um, in, on the global stage, and we really look forward to ongoing collaboration as we develop the next generation of technologies in the aerospace industry. Thank you, Jeff. Mark? Hey, good, <coughs> good morning. Um, you're going to see a little bit of a common theme, I think, in, in my, my comments as well. Um, Rolls-Royce has had a, also a long history of, of uh, collaborating with NASA in, in um, aeronautics, uh, mainly through the predecessor company, Allison Engine Company, uh, out of Indianapolis, although in some cases we've had some relationships uh, with the UK parent as well, especially in areas such as safety, et cetera. Do you have the charts coming up? Um, so, you know, and if I look at the key areas where we have um, worked together, obviously in the area of technology, ground testing, uh, flight testing, a um, couple of interesting areas that um, may not be aware of. Um, back in the 50s, the relationship started actually through the um, 
XV-13 VertiJet. Uh, it was actually led by the Air Force, but I think NASA was engaged in some of the early uh, testing aspects of it, and that had a Rolls-Royce engine uh, powering it. The Apollo program, um, also Allison actually developed the uh, fuel and oxidizer tanks for the uh, LEM and the command module. So we've been, uh, you know, in, in this time of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, we're very proud to have had a heritage uh, that had been part of that. There it is. Um, and then getting on to some of the um, aircraft technology, um, you know, back in the early 80s, we were a participant in what was called the uh, NASA Hot Section Technology, the NASA Host Program. In fact, when I first joined Allison, um, that was the first program I worked on. We did turbine uh, airfoil heat transfer uh, technology um, and did some analytical methods as well to kind of improve our predictive uh, techniques. Um, we're also, you back up one. <clears throat> we're also engaged in the um, prop fan test assessment program <clears throat> back in the mid 80s, uh, looking at the integration using uh, an Allison engine to uh, <clears throat> back, to go up. back up the other way. One more. One more. That's there it. we go. Thank you. The prop fan test assessment program, kind of looking at uh, the initial look at a prop fan. We then went to the um, uh, McDonnell Douglas uh, demonstrator program uh, <clears throat> with the twin counter rotating. In addition, we're involved in some other technology programs, the uh, NASA Advanced Subsonic Technology, looking at especially low emission combustion technology, advanced seals, and then participated in the NASA Environmental Responsible uh, Aircraft Program, looking mainly at various concepts, new types of how do you integrate propulsion and new types of aircraft concepts. And then one area where the, the UK part of Rolls-Royce was engaged, certainly is an area of safety and the, the Viper program that really all three companies were engaged in were looking at the impacts of volcanic ash on, uh, on, on engines. Uh, it was really a joint program uh, the industry participated in, uh, really to try and understand that and, and gain some data on, on what that impacts are. Let's go to the next chart. So um, one of the things I wanted to focus on, if you look at the, the core engines that we produce out of, out of Indianapolis, um, uh, Rolls-Royce North America, and I started looking at some of the heritage and what are some of the things that we developed under NASA that really have led to those. Now, those engines, we produced over uh, 6,500 of those engines. Um, they've got a common core, 80% common parts, over 70 million flying hours. They power many commercial uh, regional aircraft, business jets, as well as several military aircraft and transport uh, patrol ISR type uh, applications. And when you look at it, there's a number of areas, and I won't go into all of them, but uh, uh, one of the key areas that jumped out at me too is a lot of the uh, analytical methods. And we've worked with NASA quite a bit on uh, computational fluid dynamics codes uh, using the AP NASA tool. We've actually seen improvements in some of our components and as we've made uh, upgrades to the engines over time, those have factored in. Uh, we used another code called ADPAC that we've developed in collaboration with NASA uh, on the most recent fan variant that we have and, and really uh, pushed the performance of that fan and have, have had really good success. Um, another area where we've had strong uh, collaboration is in the area of materials and manufacturing. Um, NASA's been in, uh, partnered with MAI and so a lot of the disc alloy work and then the computational aspects of how you uh, manufacture uh, materials also has been a, a strong part where we've had we've had partnerships and then in the area of testing uh, testing materials testing coatings um, other types of component testing you know NASA has been a really valuable partner and asset in allowing us to use some of those test capabilities and collaborate in testing in, in many of those areas so if you go to the last chart um, so again looking toward the Kind of future, you know, from a Rolls-Royce standpoint, we really see uh, propulsion technology going in, in three main aspects. We're going to still continue working the engine technology uh, through the component efficiencies, pressure ratio, bypass ratio, those things. Uh, it's getting harder. We're starting to, to, uh, to push and push, but there's, we still believe there's work to do and benefits to be had. Um, and obviously then, you know, working the challenges of, of emissions and, and noise as well. Um, but we also see a strong impact of electrification. And we believe um, uh, starting small but moving up, certainly going all electric and, and probably more importantly hybrid electric are gonna show some significant benefits. And, and really NASA's been laying some of the foundation with some of the study activities looking at uh, those platforms and, and what might be the benefits, what are the technology gaps, and then what are the certification challenges and how might we deal with that. And I think that's a big area NASA, NASA can play. 
And then obviously those technologies, you know, one of the other areas where we think we'll see some strong benefits is in looking at new air vehicle concepts and then how you integrate propulsion with those air vehicle concepts. And again, NASA has been leading the way in some of those studies, again, back on the Environmental Responsible Aircraft Program. Uh, we were engaged in several studies looking at pretty, some pretty unique aircraft concepts and then how you integrate propulsion to really optimize the system. So we think this uh, strong uh, continued partnership with NASA uh, as we move forward in those areas. Thank you, Thank you. Mark. Thank you, gentlemen. So uh, uh, please uh, uh, step up and ask questions. I'll get things going here. So, um, so how far can we push the turbine engine? I mean, how, how much is left in there? I mean, we've, we've, we've achieved, on the commercial side, we've achieved, you know, it's one to two percent a year for, for uh, it just continues going on, but it's getting harder. I mean, it, um, you know, it's harder to eke more, more, uh, more power efficiency out of the core. Uh, most of our improvements coming out of the low pressure system, higher and higher bypass ratios. How can we, how, how long can we keep doing this before we have to, something has to change and what has to change? Uh, yeah, I'll, let me uh, go. Uh, um, so, I, Graham, I think I look at it in a couple of ways. F firstly, I think we can continue to get efficiency out of these out of these engines at the rate we have been seeing it. You might debate the cost that's going to come with that. Um, but, uh, you know, we look at this, uh, when you're looking at engine efficiency, you're looking at going in a propulsive or a thermodynamic direction. Um, on a propulsive basis, as you say, there's room to go given uh, that this is the direction airframes want to go in terms of increasing bypass ratio. Uh, good turbofan technologies, um, all companies are working on that to some extent. Uh, clearly, we've it's a step we've taken, and we think there's still room to go in that, in that direction. Um, when you look at the thermodynamic side, um, you know, the first uh, two-spool jet engine ran a 1,200 Fahrenheit turbine entry temperature at a steel turbine. Uh, today, we're running those sort of temperatures at the back end of our compressors. So over that, that sort of 1% to 2%, you can see the material progression as we've got into nickels, nickel alloys, and, and advanced cooling systems have allowed us to progress there. I think clearly there's runway in ceramics to continue in, in, in that direction. There's clear um, runway in terms of um, cooling schemes, coating schemes, uh, and the like in the turbines. So I see there, there, that 1% to 2%, I, th I think we've got runway there um, for the future. But the expectation is that periodically we're going to see these double-digit steps that, uh, that things like a gear, a gear would give you. That's where perhaps we'll start looking at hybridization, uh, electric propulsion. We'll start to look at more integrated um, propulsion with the airframe, which is where things like BLI come in. So I think it's going to be a bit of both, but I don't think we're at the end of the... Uh, End of the runway. Yeah, I, Jeff, I think you summed it up spot on. Um, you know, the, certainly the field of materials, there's some some runway there, and and the cooling technologies for sure, enabled by different manufacturing modalities as well as different materials, right? So it will, I think, change form as we know it today. But I agree, there's certainly runway there, and then and then lastly for the. The, the bigger step changes that Jeff talked about, we're talking kind of architectural changes that could be on the order of going from turbojet to turbofan, right? I mean, those were big steps. And to make big steps like that again, um, there's going to be some major architecture involved. And I don't think anybody knows what that architecture is yet, but beyond the 1%, 2% kind of steps, there's, there's going to be some major architectural moves that are going to be required to get those bigger steps. Yeah, certainly. Um I agree. I think, you know, material limitations are, are, are the big challenge we, we all face in terms of trying to continue to push. And as you said, the cost then to continue to, to get the, the 1% to 2% um, is, is going to get higher. And so I think we are going to look at some of those step changes where you move toward hybrid electric, more electric. Um, and I think the other area that's really, you know, it is, you know, especially on the commercial side, it's been a very traditional uh, platform, how you start to look at different types of integration, different types of platforms, 
and how that integrates, you may find more benefit in, in the integration aspect even than the, than the normal. But we're obviously all going to continue to invest in the, in the world. All the competitions are all going to invest in the 1% to 2% that we have to keep, keep trying to drive. So, so we're all back from the Paris Air Show. And, and I mean, some of the big news from the Paris Air Show was the Europeans going, going hot and heavy on, on faster reduction in emissions. I mean, they are really talking about some dramatic reductions and dramatically faster than we, the industry is kind of used to. I mean, what's your reaction to that? I mean, do you think the industry can respond to that sort of pressure? Let me uh, maybe take... I, I, um, so Graham and I talked a little, uh, a little before this. I, I was at the Paris Air Show and met with many uh, customers and uh, like, and I will say that it is um, very noticeable as you get in and you talk to the the leadership of aviation in Europe. Every conversation starts with the environment and with how we're going to drive uh, sustainment. Perhaps noticeably more than you get in in a U.S. Uh, equivalent uh, conversation today. Um, I, I think, you know, we talk about hybrid electric, we talk about electric propulsion as a way to get there. We have to be careful that we look at the total carbon footprint as we get into that conversation. But I think there's that clearly as we push in that direction, um, uh, we're going to be able to start to move uh, towards a better, a better sustainable um, position. Um, uh, the other place that that is very ripe is is the area of sustainable fuels. Um, you know, the, there is the industry at large is certifying aircraft to run on sustainable fuels today. But I think there's a long way that we can go there to get more structural adoption um, in uh, in in that direction. The other, you know, even to the extent people are looking again at hydrogen. Um, as a fuel, I mean, clearly there's a clean um, option. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. You know, the the energy density of hydrogen on a volumetric basis is three or four times that of jet fuel. So your airplanes start to look somewhat different, and you're going to be trading drag against uh, drag against that uh, that the benefits you'll be getting. But you know, I don't think that's off the table um, at at this point, at least in terms of research uh, research programs. Yeah, so Graham, I, uh, I agree with you as well, Jeff. I think combustion technologies um, still have some room to go. So, you know, your question about can, can industry respond, can we get there? I think between combustion technologies and architecture changes, primarily, again, looking at what hybrid electric and um, those in architectures could do, I think industry will be able to respond. I think it does put pressure, as we were talking out in the hall, I think it puts pressure on supersonic civil transport um, in Europe, particularly. Um, so we'll have to see how that plays out. But I think industry's got some runway to respond to the environmental challenges. Yeah, and I think, um, as you mentioned, the sustainable fuel aspect, too. I think it's going to take a combination of things. It's not going to be just one aspect. So working on the combustion process, working on fuel efficiency for carbon and and looking at hybrid electric and then also looking at sustainable fuels is going to take all of that, but I think we have to respond. I think uh, we kind of owe it to, to make sure we do, and it, and we're going to be driven that way probably anyway. So I think it's worth noting that, that the uh, NASA strategic implementation plan, which came in in about 2013, did actually anticipate this this focus, which I think is 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 a real credit to, to the work that went into that plan to make that ultra-efficient, low-carbon uh, future as, as a, as a, even though it, for NASA, they, they're living in an environment where, where climate change, or however you want to describe it, is not the, the, the flavor of the moment, they still foresaw it and, and, and do it. Um, but I have to ask a question about electric, okay? I got started writing on electric bef propulsion before it was even sort of like fashionable, and, and our readers hate it. They just beat me up every time I write about electric propulsion. They don't believe in it, right? now. So now I've shifted from saying this is cool to saying, don't blame me, it's them that's talking about it. <laughs> um, 
But I mean, are we having a mass hallucination here, or, or are you guys at the level you're working at, the detail, detail you're working at, are you genuinely seeing potential here? Yes. Uh, Mark, we'll start with sure. you. <laughs> um, yes, and, and you know, we've, uh, Rolls-Royce has taken a position that we're, we're investing in uh, electrical technology, and, and really a lot of it focused on hybrid electric and starting small, looking at small scale, because that's where it's going to happen. I mean, you, you know, you look in the, the news about every other day, there's a new EV tall electric, uh, all electric uh, system uh, looking at small startup trying to, and, and the big companies too, looking at those as well. And I think you're starting small to try and understand what are the challenges, what are the issues, and, and you know, a lot of the challenges are going to be in the certification process. Now, from a technology standpoint, you know, recognize energy storage is kind of one of the key things along with, uh, uh, the other aspects, you know, you can get there. You can have a small uh, electric vehicle, flight vehicle that can go, you know, around the city, intercity, you know, like Uber's looking at. You know, the technology is there. A lot of it now is how do you go certify it to make sure it is safe and meets all the right requirements. And I know, you know, that's a, that is a big area I think NASA can really uh, help, help play in. I think we are seeing along the larger aircraft there is more electrification happening I mean, you look at the 787 compared to, you know, and I think that will continue. I mean, I think it's a, a long way before you get a hybrid electric large large plane. A lot has to happen uh, for that to occur. But I think starting small and, and looking maybe toward regional as, as maybe a first big step uh, is, is a potential path. And, and we're involved in several programs trying to look at that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the... This is one of those technologies that does not scale particularly well with size, right? I mean, the, the, the days in which we're going to be talking about wide body civil transport electrified across the ocean, those are pretty far out kind of days, right? That's, that's the far end of the spectrum. Very close, like, like you mentioned, you know, much smaller vehicles, we're already starting to see those, those um, kind of start to hit, hit the industry. So. As energy storage density matures and as the technologies mature, it will be able to grow in size as to the size of the vehicle that, that hybrid electric is able to support. Today, we are in the lower end of the spectrum, right? But it's definitely feasible, and it's definitely, I think, already proven that there are certain advantages to it. So as the, I, the way I see this kind of unfolding is as the technology matures, we will be able to jump up in, in vehicle size and the far end of the spectrum, again, being the wide bodies, that, that at this point I think is a pretty far out um, goal. But for regionals and smaller, I think that's in the near term much more achievable. There are some also some interesting sort of potential military applications of hybridization where you can combine, you know, maybe the dash, <laughs> the dash capability of a turbine with the loiter cap quiet loiter capability of an electric Absolutely. or something. And also most electric pl uh, military platforms are going to need an awful lot of electric power on them. Yes. So you're already, gonna, you're already doing a lot of that stuff on the platform anyway. Jeff, that's right. Yeah. So I, I, a couple of comments here. So in a in another life, when I, I took a vacation from propulsion work and worked up in Collins, as uh, as Graham said, I in that in that life I actually ran the electric systems work on the seven eight seven. So I got a, a very good appreciation of where electrification can really benefit if you take it at an airplane level. So as we've looked at. Uh, hybrid electric propulsion, I'll, I'll leave to one side the, the, the small EV toll world, but as we look at it applied to regional and then getting up into large commercial airplanes, um, I think if you think about it as a part-for-part -part replacement of a conventional um, engine and you don't think of it in terms of airplane level solutions, you're going to miss benefit. You may you may be able to surprise yourself, there's a few percent there, but to make it worthwhile, I think there has to be a fully integrated uh, solution. Uh, you know, at, uh, at UTC, we've, um, we've sort of focused in on what the, the megawatt power motors, motor drives, kilovolt level distribution systems uh, can provide. And if you look at it on a regional aircraft basis, you know, that, that, that gives you sort of 50% of the, the power that a, a small turboprop might, uh, might, might need. So you get into hybrid solutions that get quite interesting in terms of how small can you make the engine. But again, 
if you just look at the engine side, the trades sort of maybe balance, but if you can get into maybe changing the way the propulsion system works at the airplane level, you get there. Um, if you look at it on the large commercial side where you know, a megawatt may be 5% of the, the total power demand or give or take um, on, on an engine level, what, you, know, you may get some augmentation. We, we think about it as a mildly hybrid um, solution. But if you can extend it to the point where you're actually using motors to affect the operability of the engine and you can start to really integrate it, not just as a, as a propulsion uh, system, but as a propulsion and operability and linked into the airplane systems in a, in a tighter way, you can start to see some of the... Uh, like you can, can up, have the engine operating closer to its ideal point from more of the flight or something like it, that. It, 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 exactly so. You know, you're going to use, you know, if it's a large commercial, you're going to use that. That You're going to be able to shrink your core down. You'll be able to uh, actually run it right on its design point in cruise and maybe use your electric motor as a thrust augmentation for takeoff and flying. Just one other comment on that, too. The other thing that electrification can help with is if you look want to look more toward like distributed propulsion or putting in some type of uh, boundary layer ingestion system on there. If you believe at a system level that really works and it's going to help, you know, trying to do it through gears and shafts is a very, you know, it really is a non-starter. So electrification can help you do that by just, you know, driving electric generators and cabling it out to the... To the yeah, and, uh, I mean, I think it goes beyond just thinking about it at the system level. I mean, we have to actually think of the business model as well. You know, if we end up with these, if we recreate uh, regional aviation, we kind of have to recreate the regional aircraft operators. They don't exist anymore. You know, the guys that fly short ranges are not there anymore. Uh, if we want to go to the airlines and say, we can cut your, emi your emissions 80%, but you can only fly 500 miles or something like that. You know, they've got to change the way they operate. So there has to be, it's not just the system level, it goes even above that. You know, and I don't know, it's a difficult thing to do. We've not had to do this before. You know, it, everything's sort of been an incremental change, but when you look at electric, there are so many things that may have to change that it's a sort of bigger step. Uh, so do we have any questions before I... Um, before I uh... Oh, do we have... Uh, so there's a, so a couple of questions that have come about from our conference's I.O. tool, where oh, a few okay. people have uh, asked questions. So one of them is, uh, where do the new ICAO regulations, such as the new particulate matter standard, fit into how much effort is being placed on hybrid electric versus conventional aircraft? I think, well, just in short, I mean, the, the standards drive us to think quite a bit about how we can comply with that and, and actually, you know, that this industry is a very long cycle business. So not only are we considering the standards that exist today, but really trying to think about where they're going to exist in the future. Because when you're planning in, in this business, right, these, these machines are going to stay on for 20, 30, 40 years. And so, so the ability to, to try and predict where that's going to go, and directionally it's very obvious, um, but the magnitude of what you have to achieve by when is where we spend a lot of time considering what our architectures look like. So I would say it's a very significant player, not, not only in what's currently um, published, but, but forecasting what we think will be published. Yeah, we can't be reactive. <laughs> we have to be planning well ahead and understand where we think the regulations are going and try and drive I mean, I, I, those I, solutions. I'll just go back to the, the, the comment that was made on, you know, what you're seeing in Europe. I think the ICAO standards are important, but I, I, I wonder if certain, uh, you know, there's certain parts of the world that are actually going to drive much more aggressively in that area. So it, you have to be thinking beyond all the time beyond, beyond what you see today. Yeah. Great. Okay, here's another one. Um, how much does industry rely on NASA capabilities, facilities, and expertise in advancing technologies? Well, I think that, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think to some extent, I think we all showed that in some of our introductory comments, the, the real strong relationship with the NASA technology work and how it's fed into our products. And also, the, I, I agree the facilities are extremely important too. You know, there are one of a kind facilities here that are national assets, and we as industry can't afford to have all of those facilities ourselves. Certainly we can't. And so um, those things are very important to us, and we do 
try and take advantage of those. And I think, again, I think we showed through our history we have absolutely, um, um, you know, it's been extremely important the collaboration we've had with NASA to make to, uh, and, and the impact it's had on our products has been substantial. I, I, you know, the, the, the other thing I'd, uh, I'd add, because I, I, Mark's exactly right, I, th I think as we've looked at the, uh, the, some of the material we presented earlier, there's clearly a, a track record. The, the, the other thing that's, um, that's striking here is as you're thinking about your technology roadmaps in, you know, within a company, within industry, you have to make sure that you've got total stakeholder um, viewpoints and, and I think that the NASA uh, perspective on, you know, where is funding, there's a, a great process of collaboration and iteration on where to focus technology. So it's, it's not a one way, you know, we come up with a great path to go down and look for where the collaboration could come. We actually need to listen to what's coming in through uh, the you know government institutions and stuff which have a broader network of what society is looking for. So we know that you know NASA, NASA famously doesn't have a lot of money for aeronautics uh, and has to spread it over a, a bunch of things. But 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 as we as we sit now, I mean we, we saw Quixi, we saw Ecube. These were really big demonstrator programs that influenced generations of engines. So as we stand now, what is it that you kind of want NASA to do to, do to help you? I mean, it, when we look at electric or hybrid electric or, or whatever it is, I mean, what do you, what, and Mark, you mentioned, cert, you know, helping with certification, which I see more and more analytical tools and certification being areas where NASA generates data that, that can be used in that. I don't know. But what are you telling NASA what, 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 that you want as an industry, a propulsion industry now to, going forward? Yeah, so so um, it's it's all valuable, right? Tools and data analysis, that's all valuable. The the just in, in some of the history that I went through in preparing for this, quite frankly, some of the most valuable uh, information that came out of NASA collaboration was was kind of as Jeff alluded to, the 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 glue or the collaboration that is bigger than any single industry, right? Um, that's essential, and quite frankly, the, the demonstrators have been the ones that had the most profound impact, because uh, that's where the, the, the rubber hits the road and you get to reduce to practice all of the, the technology that's come to bear at that point in time. So the, the, the two things being the, the collaborative nature of NASA and its mission of bringing the industries together and demonstrating key technologies that have lived and are living for decades are the two kind of most fundamental things I see. Yeah, I would add, um, and I mentioned earlier, you know, a, a lot of the work on developing models, developing analytical capabilities, helping integrate those, some of the materials work, all extremely important. But I think there is an element of driving towards something like an X-plane or some demonstrator that is important. I think, and I think actually the part about the X-plane that's really important is you're now getting the integration with the vehicle as well, which I think is becoming more and more important. So I think striving toward having those critical demonstrator programs is, is important, is a key thing. We're, and, you know, hybrid electric is one that is probably, um, you know, I know we're doing supersonic, but hybrid electric is probably one that's uh, important near term. Yeah, I, I so look, when you when you're sitting in a in industry, you're sitting in a in a business. You're you're making decisions about your technology roadmaps and direction that are tuned somewhat to the near term. And you, you're clearly looking to to make sure that you're growing for the long term. But there are business constraints on any one business that will tend to shape your your, your roadmaps. Um, I think. The, the, the role NASA that we really look, look for is that vision and the leverage to really drive for a vision that industry can rally around. So, you know, collaborative, um, collaborative demonstrations, collaborative platforms that are focused on those longer term visions is really where you get great leverage from, from NASA that we need to encourage. Do we have any more over there? Uh, sorry, 
Um, what effect did the N plus three studies have on your company's view of the future? By the way, N plus, I presume most of you go will know, but there was, NASA did a whole series of generational studies on air, on air vehicles. A commercial aircraft, N plus one was, was one generation beyond today. N plus two was two, N plus three. N plus three was 2035 time frame, I think, if I remember rightly. Sorry, good. Um, yeah, so we, we were involved in, in several of the studies looking at um, air vehicles in that in that time period, and I think what it what it did drive is toward looking um, a little bit as as Jeff said, what are the real future things we have to be looking at, and uh, driving toward you know really really high bypass ratios, really really um, uh, you know stringent cycles, looking at even um, novel cycles, and even it kind of spun a little bit in toward you know, hybrid electric as being one of the areas that, that could be a way, a way forward to try and help meet those. So um, it has been helping us chart the longer term path for us, certainly, as opposed to the, the near term path. I think one of the things that's interest, that interests me look, watching NASA is that and it, not, what's challenging NASA at the moment is the pace at which the industry, not, and it's the non-traditional industry, is moving. You know, mm -hmm. the, This happened with drones. It's happening with unmanned air vehicles, where, uh, unmanned air mobility, where NASA sort of gets thinking about it, but then the, the sort of the startups are just, and they're flying things. Only, and then they, so NASA has to say, what's our role? You know, so you're at UTC, it's going to fly hydroelectric. Demonstrator. I mean, roles. I think is. I mean, you've run stuff on the ground, and you're heading towards that. G. Similarly, so that it becomes an interesting challenge. Then is to where does NASA step in, and what can NASA do at that point in time when there's already stuff sort of out there and flying at an industry level that can bring it. And I think I keep coming back to it's the it's the it's the ground truth data and the certification quality data that they generate the ind individual industry efforts don't. Is, am, I, am I correct in, in, in sort of, it, it, it's this ability to bring the collaboration, to bring data to the table for the FAA and everything like that, that allows you to move forward. So they have to do something of a scale that generates that data there. I mean, is that a correct assessment or? So, uh, so you know, NASA uh, really provides, you know, uh, for us, it's a couple of things. The, the work towards those underlying technologies that have, I'm going to call it credibility and have solid foundation to them, you know, you, I agree, there is a tremendous, you know, there are 150 companies out there um, doing eVTOL work at various levels. Um, you know, I always say it, it, it's not that hard to make something fly. You go fast enough with something that approximates to a wing, you'll get off the ground. Doing it in a way that actually is safe, is reliable, is economic, um, is a lot harder. Uh, that's why there's not many companies that do it. Uh, and I think the role, a key role here is what are those underlying truths that actually translate from um, something that's flying and looks good in a brochure to something that's actually a practical um, and, uh, and useful product. That, that's where those underlying technologies, those certification um, items really, really play in. Yeah. Okay, no, the certification point uh, is key, right? Because a lot of what those future architectures look like are still, quite frankly, up in the air. And so I think when industry and partners start to rally around um, what that looks like in general, the, the certification path and, and the uh, essential elements to do that, I think is a, a very clear place where NASA will play next as well, and the FAA, clearly. I think one other area, too, is in the area where, you know, we know there are certain limitations today on things like energy storage, you know, uh, power density of energy storage and that type of thing. Where NASA can also play a role is helping push the capabilities of some of the fundamental technology areas that can help the broad industry then make these solutions work. So I think that's another area. Yeah, particularly, you know, we've, we've relied so far on air, um, automotive to drive battery technology, but they're no longer heading in the direction right. that we want to go in. Exactly. So we've got, to, we've got to step in and do, so, uh, over there. 
Are you getting what you need in terms of workforce development for the future? And if not, what would you ask universities to do, imagining that you had a magic wand? <laughs> uh, so uh, workforce development. Well, I, you know, right now is a pretty amazing time in the aviation industry. And uh, quite frankly, the, one of the biggest challenges is just getting enough engineers and technical minds to work on it. Both the military and commercial side of the air breathing propulsion business is quite frankly at a rather unprecedented rate. And so we certainly challenge, are challenged with being able to get qualified talent around the world. So um, the, the quality that we see coming out of universities is good. The collaboration uh, and the industry partnerships that we see with universities has changed quite a bit. We see a lot of universities that are driving more industry collaboration early uh, in the undergrad years, which is great. Uh, that makes a difference in the first few years coming out of school with the talent we see. So that, that trajectory has been wonderful. We just, we just want to get more talent into the pipeline. So, uh, I've, uh, how long do we have on this topic? It's, uh, this, this, this could go for a while. Um, so at, at Pratt & Whitney, we've, we've grown our engineering workforce by a little over 20% in the last four or five years. So we, and a lot of that um, recruitment, it's on the back of you know, a lot of great programs that are, that, that are ongoing. Um, and a lot of that recruitment has come from young engineers, recent graduates, uh, uh, and, and so forth. Um, I tell you, that, that there is no question that the quality of engineers that we're getting is, is top-notch, uh, you know, really, really smart, smart folks. Um, it, it has sometimes proved a little difficult to bridge the gap between the expectations of a digital, um, uh, a digitally attuned graduate to some of the, the more mechanical areas. Um, so it, here, I, I spoke to a, a team of interns uh, last summer, and one of the questions from the room was, are we concerned that we don't have a very innovative um, uh, company? And I, I said, look, um, if by innovation do you mean we don't make many apps, then, you know, okay, yeah. that's, that's right. But we just spent $10 billion over the last two decades developing uh, a, an engine architecture that is delivering double digit improvements in fuel burn, which by any measure is right at the leading edge of, of innovation. And trying to make sure that somebody coming from through a world where they've grown up in this very digital um, environment, which has a lot of great application in industry, but they still feel passion about the the heart of a mechanical system is is something where you have to find the right people. You're you're in a competition uh, for the for the really bright brains and uh, that are coming out of universities. I, I think the other aspect is also there's certain specialized skills that are harder to get than others, especially in our industry. So, you know, moving toward example, hybrid electric, getting electrical engineers, and even more importantly getting people who know both mechanical and electrical is, is a very um, uh, sparse skill set. Cyber people, you know, trying to get them into our industry, which is becoming more important, important both on, on, the, on the military and the, and the commercial as well, um, is, is difficult because they have so many other places they can go. And so there are some skill sets that I think as we're looking ahead are, are, have been a challenge and are, are going to be a challenge. I mean, when, when I go around the universities, I'm impressed by... I mean, and I'm reaching back a long time to my university years, but, you know, I mean, there is more work at university level at being multidisciplinary, you know, bringing the different departments together on, on, on things, and I think that's really where... Because, I mean, I think the, the best bit of engineering today must be in the interstices between the disciplines. That's the hard problem, you see, then. And if you want to inspire an engineer, get them to look at those interstices. That's a real tough problem. So the more that I think the universities can bring them together at the university and f make them look at those joins between the disciplines, maybe they'll be the give you the type of guys you want, the get late and ladies you want. Okay, we have about five more minutes, so we'll maybe take one more question. 
Um, you spoke about new architecture. Oh, sorry. You spoke about new architectures to get higher efficiency. I assume this means a much deeper integration with your airframer partners. So as an example, I've heard that it's, it's been said that a hypersonic vehicle is an engine with wings. Uh, do the airframers share your view on this architecture shift? So I, I, as far as the next step of uh, efficiency being an integrated system, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement between airframers and engine OEMs that that is an advantage, right? Now, now who's going to lead and who's going to follow in that, I think, is where we end up having the discussion. The fact that it's a, the, the right thing to do as far as from, from a technical standpoint for efficiency, uh, I, I don't feel a lot of argument or pushback there, but certainly who's leading and who's following is where, where I think we're having the discussions now. Yeah, and I think it, um, you know, certainly it is driving closer collaboration early, um, and we're having to share models together early because as they're doing their rubber aircraft, we have to give them rubber propulsion systems, and then you have to look at, well, now what do you do if they're, they want to look at a, a distributed system that looks like this versus that, and how do we, so it's, it is driving a lot more thoughts on, on how we model the systems and how we share the models, but um, um, I think, yeah, I think it's acknowledged on their side as well that you got to work much more closely earlier uh, to really best do the optimization. There's, there's a couple of interesting things you get into uh, here. You know, traditionally, um, air framers have enjoyed having, I mean, there are three engine manufacturers in the world, primary engine manufacturers, here they are. Um, and so as you start working integration between an engine and an airframe, they want to make sure that that integration is going to work is actually engine agnostic. And that can sometimes work against you because different people have different ways of playing that integration. You want to integrate your ECS system into your engine. That may work for one engine architecture, may not another. So there are some sort of hurdles in collaboration, sort of coming back to, you know, where can NASA help in terms of defining these sort of architectures that everyone can subscribe to and, and become uh, uh, sort of become basic standards that we can work around, then that tends to help us work together in, in those areas. So I think you should, you should, you should note one event, a recent event, and that was the uh, agreement by Rolls to purchase uh, Siemens electric air uh, propulsion business. Because when the Airbus launched the EFAN-X uh, program, it had this interesting thing where a, a, a Siemens had inserted itself into the propulsion chain between, between the engine manufacturer and the airframe, but all of a sudden there was this company called Siemens, which, you know, makes trains and things like that. And, and, the, and that was what had the industry really paying attention. Hang on a minute, the whole balance of power here is shifting because the integration is shifting and there's these new systems. Well, we've seen a bit of a writing of that by the fact that Rolls is taking, taking the, uh, the Siemens piece, which gives them back more of a traditional breakpoint between the propulsion and the air. But, it, but it's not the same breakpoint as it was before because there are so many system implications on one and the other. And it is going to be difficult going forward, and there is a lot to be done before we get to that balance of power. But, I, but I'll just finish by, by saying that, the, that if I was... It's 40-plus years since I was an engineer, but if I was an engineer now, I'd want to be an airframe engineer at an engine manufacturer or an engine engineer at an airframe manufacturer, because that's where all the act action is going on. So I want to thank you. Uh, would you please all thank our speakers today? They were great. Thank you.